Hello there and welcome for those of you who are out there. Uh, we're going to be up and running in five minutes. So I'm hoping everybody's out there and um, say hello if you are. And look at that. Shelley, hello and straight away. Wonderful. Hello to you. I'm here, all set up. Have me a cup of coffee. On a very cold day in Pittsburgh. At least it's not spring. Ah. I think uh, I have to send a little message. Hello, Anne. <laughs> Unbooting, debooting, and rebooting, Anne. What a wonderful set of it. You were a technical genius. Congratulations. Probably I couldn't do that. Hello, James from Greenberg. Hello, Grace from Dublin. Welcome back. And David. Yes, I love near Stratford in the UK. When you're over here, you have to qualify Stratford as being in the UK because it could be mistaken for Canada. Hello, Bruce in New Haven. They're all coming in. Uh, so... I have to send another little message. <sighs> Hello, John from Liverpool. Liverpool is very dear to my heart. Hello, Marlene in Squirrel Hill. The cold part of Pittsburgh, like here in Regent Square. It's what we used to describe as a grand fresh morning, meaning if you walk out there, everything on you turns to icicles. It's like the other Irish term, you know, it's Bucketing rain, and somebody will say, Ah, it's a grand soft day. Mind you, most days tend to be soft days in Ireland and grand. All right, we're coming up to time, we're getting there. I do like saying hello to everybody. It's nice that you're out there. One of the strange thing about webinars is that you sit here talking to your computer and the only thing you see is your own face, which can be very depressing. But uh, knowing you're out there is a lovely thing. So, who else is out there? Who else is listening in? Oh yes, look, there's the information. You can always make it at the information about donation. We're always very grateful for every dollar, every 
punt, every euro, every zloty that you can send. Never be afraid to think, I'd love to donate to Pict, because we so much need those donations. And they help to keep these webinars going, apart from anything else. Yes, if you do have questions as we go along, type them in, we'll, and if we can get to them, we most certainly will. And if we can't get to them in the in the program, we will respond uh, on uh, on uh, email afterwards. Once we have your email address, we can email you a response. Hello, Irish Pete. I'm glad you're out here, out there. Joe from Baltimore. Welcome. I'll explain the headphones in a second. Very nice to have, I know we have an awful lot of people who listen in from Pittsburgh, but uh, it's nice to know there are people out there across across the United States and across across the world who come in every every week to uh, to listen in, to join with us in this celebration of the art of theater. I call it a celebration, it's just me talking about it, so, you know. I celebrate the art of theatre, and you celebrate it with me. I hope everybody is still well and safe from COVID as well. Uh, James, you would not want to see my face. My brother says I look like a homeless man, not shaving. Well, you know, I mean, I need a haircut. Uh, we all look a bit rough, I think, apart from the ladies. The ladies never look a bit rough. But we gentlemen do look a bit rough as a result of this isolation. Hello, Helen. Lovely that you're joining us again. I mean, I personally think I look a bit rough, to be honest. But then I always do, so it doesn't really worry me. COVID, COVID isolation or no COVID isolation, it doesn't really change. A lifetime of putting on makeup always made me feel better. And I mean that in a theatrical sense. Yeah. Okay. So I think we'll um, I think we'll begin because it's gone two o'clock. So first of all, uh, why am I wearing headphones? Because on this new format, we have guests on the program today. Hello, Debbie. And we that means that if I don't wear headphones, we get feedback. So I'm wearing headphones, but my guests don't need to. So that's the reason for this. It's not that I've gone deaf or anything from gross old age. Hello, Pat and Carolyn. Um, so today we're going to be discussing uh, one of Ireland's most remarkable writers, John B. Keane. Um, we've, I've mentioned him before, we've talked about him before, um, and we've presented two of his productions here at Picked in the last, in the last while, and I should turn my phone down. Um, so uh, to, to join me on this, uh, we have back, and she was with us before talking about John Millington Singh, um, one of my favorite people in Ireland, uh, Aoife Spillane Hinks. Aoife, are you there? Hello. There she is. Hello and welcome. Aoife, um, for those of you who do know or may not know, direct, has directed three productions for us at Picked in the last few years. Uh, John B. Keane's Sharon's Grave, um, Beckett's Waiting for Godot, and way back eight years ago now, uh, the remarkable play Our Class. So Aoife is well and truly a part of the Pick family. And today we're going to talk about something that fascinates us both. And it came out of the discussion on, on uh, John Millington Singh. And that is the Kerry playwright, John B. Keane. And uh, I'm going to let Aoife start the ball rolling on the topic of, because the particular topic I, I want us to look at is his plays of poverty. Um, which really do, um, really are the essence of Irish folk drama. Eva, Thank you so much, Alan. Um, thank you so much for being here this evening. I am so delighted uh, to be here. And um, hello from Dublin. So I'm going to do a really annoying thing and toss this back over to Alan briefly. 
because I have asked him to read a poem to start us off this evening or this afternoon. So we're in Pittsburgh and elsewhere. Um, this is a poem called Epic by the great Irish poet Patrick Kavanagh. And he wrote this in 1938. So Alan. I have lived in important places, times when great events were decided. Who owned that half rood of rock, a no man's land surrounded by our pitchfork armed claims? I heard the Duffies shouting, damn your soul, and old McCabe stripped to the waist, seen step the plot defying blue cast steel. Here is the march along these iron stones. That was the year of the Munich bother. Which was most important? I inclined to lose my faith in Bally Rush and Gortine, till Homer's ghost came whispering in my mind. He said, I made the Iliad from such a local row. Gods make their own importance. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Uh, he was a beautiful writer as well, but the intrinsic point in that poem concerns the universita universality of what is local. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Alan. So I want you to keep that in mind as we, not Alan, <laughs> now I'm talking <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> Alan, you keep it in mind as well. I will as well, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like you to keep that in mind as we talk about John B. Keane, and as we think about him, and as we think about the life and the lives out of which he comes and out of which his work comes. And we will actually return to Kavanaugh, um, some of his prose, with some ideas that tie into all of this a bit later. But let's let's just get a sense of, of, of the basics about John B. Keane. John B. Keane was born in County Kerry in the south of Ireland in 1928. He was the fourth of 10 children and his father was a school teacher. John B. Keane is from a town in Kerry called Listowel. It's a market town in the north of the county in the southwest of Ireland where Kerry is. Listowel and the surrounding area is famous as the birthplace of many of Ireland's great writers, including Brian McMahon, Brendan Kennelly, and George Fitzmaurice, and Listowel Writers Week, which has been going since it was found, it was launched in '70, and and uh, and first had its first festival in 1971. Um, it's a celebra celebrated literary festival that runs in Listowel and has been running for the last 50 years. In 1951, he did what so many young people of his generation did, and headed to Britain to find work. For the next four years, he worked as a street cleaner and a barman before returning to Listowel. He married his childhood sweetheart, Mary O'Connor, and they bought the pub in which he was to find inspiration for many of his great plays, and which is still running in Listowel today, when pubs can reopen, that is. This was the true beginning of his life as a writer. Keane said of his customers, I discovered that my material was in these people. They came into the pub, particularly on a Friday, which was pension day, old women with pipes and old men with stories to tell. I talked to them, argued with them, got drunk with them. He went on to say, the saddest thing of all is that so many passed on without leaving anything behind them. People with marvelous stories, with marvelous stores of stories and songs and anecdotes, it all went down with them. It was the reason I became a playwright. I don't have any doubt about it. According to one man in the area, it's common in Listowel to say that John B. Keane was the smartest man of them all because he took down what we said 
and then he charged us to read it. Now, I want to tell a story um, about John B. Keane's pub um, that was shared with me uh, by a friend of mine and a, a great colleague, a great artistic colleague from out west in County Galway, um, a great, great man named James Harold. And um, he and I were chatting on Facebook Messenger yesterday about this talk and about John B. Keane. And James told me this story about himself and his wife, the artist Dolores Lynn. He wrote, years ago, Dolores and I were en route to Killarney. We weren't long an item. We made a detour to Listole and called in to John B. He was behind the bar. We were sitting side by side at the bar facing him. He took my left hand and Dahl's right in his hands, and he said, I know both of your families. You'll get on well together. It was as if he married us. That's what it felt like, and we did feel blessed and married by him from then on. It was truly one of the most deeply felt moments of my life. I could feel his empathy and wisdom. He was looking into our souls. It wasn't theatrical in the pejorative sense or highly wrought, but quiet and powerful. For me, James's words here draw my mind to the great plays of John B. Keane. That feeling of epic, monumental power infusing a gesture as intimate as two hands coming together. John B. Keane had an enormous profile. He simultaneously wrote two columns for two different newspapers, the Evening Herald and the Limerick Leader, and was ever present on Irish late night TV. As a prominent supporter of the Fine Gael political party, he was even encouraged to run for president in the 1990 presidential election. He ultimately said in a completely um, a uh, completely on-brand uh, statement. He said, I looked at myself in the mirror this morning when I was shaving and I didn't see a president. Many folks will know that Mary Robinson won that election, making her the first female president of Ireland, but not the last. John B. Keane died in 2002 at the age of, I have 72, but that math doesn't add up. I'll have a look at that later. Anyway, John B. Keane wrote more than 18 plays and 32 works of prose and poetry. And as I've mentioned, a great number of these were heavily influenced by the people he had encountered in his hometown of Listol. The RTE producer, and RTE is the, um, the national uh, television broadcaster and radio broadcaster. One of the producers there named Seamus Hosey once described Keane's genius as turning the parochial and the particular into the universal world of art. And now this is where I'll go back to some more words of Patrick Kavanaugh's, whose brilliant poem epic we heard read so beautifully by Alan, on the difference between parochialism and provincialism. Kavanaugh wrote, parochialism and provincialism are direct opposites. The provincial has no mind of his own. He does not trust what his eyes see until he has heard what the metropolis towards which his eyes are always turned has to say on any subject. This runs through all activities. The parochial mentality, on the other hand, is never in doubt about the social and artistic validity of his parish. To be parochial, a man needs the right kind of sensitive courage and the right kind of sensitive humility. This is a brilliant principle to keep in mind when we think about Keane. So let's talk about just a couple of the influences that we see in John B. Keane's plays. And we could have the entire session on this. And, uh, you know, and we might talk about this a bit later, but Alan and I even have just been texting over the last couple of days. You're seeing Ibsen in the work. You're seeing all sorts of both modern and uh, 
hundreds of years old or ancient uh, literary and dramatic influences on the work of Keane. Um, but we'll talk about a couple of, uh, of main influences. So first, John Millington Singh, who Alan has already mentioned and who bears a direct um, line from his work into Keane's work. And, and uh, you know, we talk about the peasant plays, as people will call them, of John Millington Singh. And, you know, poverty plays, the folk plays, peasant plays, these are all terms that have been applied to both Singh's work and some of the great plays of Keane's work. So think about these focuses when we think about the links between Singh and Keane. Writing about peasants or writing about people who are living rural lives, it's not about a life that is purer or more naive than the life one could lead in a more industrial location. These rural people and their stories are compelling because they possess specific characteristics that are of particular artistic interest. The bilingual poetry on their lips, right? Both of these writers are working with Irish and English and a language, a poetic language that lives straddling those two languages. Their direct relationship with nature, which makes them keenly observant. And the near exclusive community determination and enforcement of values and regulations often displacing the power that police and clergy might be expected to hold. This is something that you see on the Aran Islands with Singh's work um, in that you might not have any police patrol. You might very likely not have any police patrol on one of the Aran Islands, especially in Ishman, where Singh focused so much of his time and attention. So what does that do to how we determine and enforce what we agree as a community are our norms and standards, and what are the punishments, the consequences, if we or someone within us falls outside of that? And certainly, what are the consequences if an outsider falls outside of the bounds of what we determine is acceptable? Keane has a great quote that relates into this and relates into his connection to saying, he said, Whoever the man was who invented the word kolchi, and kolchi is a pejorative word for someone from rural Ireland. So someone from Dublin might say, might talk about someone who's a kolchi, who's from County Galway or County Kerry. Whoever the man was who invented the word kolchi, I was pitted against him. Even certain drawing room elements of my own locality would not accept these people were valid. They were there to be scoffed at. But they're the most dignified people of all because they're closer to the earth. Now, I'll point out some other resonances of Singh in some of Keane's work when we get to describing some particulars of the three plays of Keane's that we're talking about tonight, today. When we talk about the Irish that's in Keane's work, you know, we talked a lot about the Irish that's in Singh's work, and that's definitely uh, infusing the language and the identity and the sensibility of Keane's work as well. Irish is even more prominent and less anglicized than in Singh. Although Keane's use of Irish continues to be generally restricted to a word or a phrase rather than larger pieces of text. So this is Irish that is still very much living within, sort of sitting on a couch of English, um, which would be very representative of English usage, both in Ireland at the time and today, but especially in the location that he was writing about. And Keane said of the way that people spoke in Kerry, it was a beautiful, unique language, neither English nor Irish. It was never less than poetic. Now, something that we talked about a fair bit when we talked about the Playboy of the Western World by John Millington Singh was the focus on outsiders and tramps. You know, we talked a lot about the sort of biographical relationship between Singh 
Singh's own life and his experience and the way that he himself identified with the figure of the tramp and so on and so forth. Um, we've got someone like Pater Minogue, who's the itinerant Thatcher um, in Sharon's grave, who arrives in to Tracy Conley's small farmhouse as a stranger looking for work, thatching uh, roofs. This is in Sharon's grave, one of Keane's plays. Um, his unfamiliarity is both a danger and a stimulant. And interestingly, not long after he arrives, a local woman quizzes him at length on his family until she can pinpoint a great uncle of his, that's a relative of his who she knows. Then she can place him in contact um, and uh, make him a little bit less of an outsider, but he's still very much an outsider. But in Keene, we have outsiders from further afield, like William D, who arrives into a small Kerry town from England in John B. Keene's celebrated play, The Field, looking to buy a field that the Bull McCabe believes is rightfully his. Outsiders like Dee also come to represent a sea change occurring in Irish society and the resistance that can arise to this. And we'll touch on this as well in a little while. Another huge uh, influence, or at least something that you can see resonating through Keane's plays, and I can only imagine was in his mind in some fashion, is Shakespeare. You see traces of Lear everywhere. You see Macbeth, you see Romeo and Juliet, so many different pieces of characters, of plots, of everything else, running through Keane's great rural plays. You can see it in the characterization, in the scale and epic quality of circumstance and choice, and in the themes that Keane's plays explore. And it's also worth mentioning, although we won't go into much detail uh, with this final influence that I'll mention, but we must give a nod to Dion Boussico, who was the great 19th century actor and playwright famed for his epic melodramas. And again, this word epic, right? We started with a poem that's called epic that says gods make their own importance. The epic is not necessarily about the Trojan War, but every epic uh, standoff, battle, argument, situation feels as big as that. And Boussico's elevation, heightened circumstance, even as it might have been a bit more, well, actually, I won't even say, because I was going to say melodramatic or romantic or comedic, but Keane has all of that stuff as well. So let's talk about a theme that you see come up in the biographies, the early careers of so many of Ireland's great playwrights, which is rejection at the Abbey, rejection by the Abbey. So a quote from Keane was, my early dealings with the Abbey were not at all happy, but I held my own and they discovered I wouldn't go away. And Sive, one of his very, very earliest plays, was famously rejected by the Abbey in the late, uh, in the late 1950s. What happens because of that is that Keane's work is growing and developing and premiering down south, right? Dublin's up, they're doing their thing, they're making uh, exclusionary choices, some unfortunate choices in retrospect, and the work is therefore then premiering down with community groups, with amateur drama groups down in Kerry, down in Cork. So, and just to mention, as I've said, you know, he, he wasn't alone. Some of Ireland's greatest playwrights, such as Keane's contemporary Tom Murphy, had to look elsewhere for, produ for productions for many long years before the Abbey would stage their plays. And interestingly, the great Irish theatre scholar, Lionel Pilkington, writes of, quote, the striking coincidence between a widespread impression of the Abbey Theatre's irrelevance in the 1950s and early 1960s, and the simultaneous emergence of what has been described as Irish drama's, quote, second re renaissance, of which Keane was certainly a part. But I mentioned that this sent Keane back down south 
to premiere his work initially with companies and groups that are down there in Kerry, in Cork. And what happens then? So Sive is first produced in 1959 by the Listol Drama Group, which was the local amateur theater company. Now, I'll give a bit of explanation for amateur theater which probably sounds familiar or might be well known to a lot of folks, but it's similar to community theater in the States, um, but its prevalence, its influence um, is, you can't overstate how profoundly rooted in Irish culture and especially Irish rural culture, amateur drama is. It's serious business in this country. These community drama groups, made up of people with, with full-time jobs or other commitments, undergo extended rehearsal periods during their members' free time. While, oh, excuse me, while amateur drama exists everywhere in Ireland, it tends to be strongest in rural areas. Months upon months can go into the study, staging, and refining of a production. And the audiences that amateur productions draw often dwarf those of professional shows. Amateur drama groups are rich repositories of theatrical knowledge and dramatic literacy. And I will just tell a side story, um, which I'm sure Alan has experienced many times. Um, but people, you know, actors in Ireland, especially Dublin actors, who would have experience touring around the country with a show, maybe a classic Irish play or a Shakespeare or, or any number of kinds of plays, almost everybody has had the experience, and especially in Cork, um, where after the show, you'll be in the theatre bar, you know, you'll have finished, you've come off the stage, you finished your performance, and somebody from the audience, a local person will come up and they'll say, you know, you were, you were great, you were fantastic in that show. And you know, the actor, the professional actor from Dublin will say, oh, thank you so much. And uh, the local person will go on to say, yeah, I mean, now, John, John Joe, who did it last year, who did that role, I mean, he was amazing. He really got it, but you were really good. And this sense of absolute seriousness and absolute achievement that runs through um, the amateur drama circuit is exhilarating and has been a hugely galvanizing force for theatrical development, for theatrical culture and culture in general in a way that's, again, hard to overstate. Big thing that goes on on the amateur drama uh, circuit is the All-Ireland Drama Festival. And in 1959, Sive won the All-Ireland Drama Festival, which is a nationwide week-long competition in which the top amateur productions from around the country come to be judged. Ironically, the prize for winning the festival was to perform the play in the Abbey Theatre, but not as an Abbey show, not as an Abbey production. It ran to sold out audiences, but it would, near, it would be nearly 30 more years before the play was staged as an official Abbey production. So let's talk about Sive, this 1959 show, which was his breakthrough production. Sive is the tragic story of a very young woman whose aunt and uncle try to force her into an arranged marriage with a very old man with tragic consequences. But this is not just the story of venal and selfish older people. It is about the crushing effects of sacrifice and deprivation. It is about the consequences of denying the orders of nature and perhaps of God. And fittingly, as a story of an old man trying to buy a young girl, it is about the volatility of a country moving from one era to another. And this idea of moving from one era to another it comes to life in this striking piece of text, which is spoken by Pat's Bocock, a poverty-stricken traveller who comes to the house, one of these wanderers in Keane's plays. And so in Sive, Pat says, the face of the country is changing. The small man with one cow and the pig and the bit of bog is coming into his own. 
He is pulling himself out of the mud and the dirt of the years. He is coming away from the dunghill and the smoky corner. The shopkeeper is losing his stiffness. Tis only what I see in my travels. The farmer will be the new lord of the land. What way will he rule? What way will he hold up under new riches? There will be great changes everywhere. The servant boy is wearing the collar and tie. The servant girl is painting and powdering and putting silkified stockings on her feet and wearing frilly small clothes under her dress. Tis only what I see in my travels. The servant will kick off the traces and take to the high road. Money will be in a plenty. So there's a nation in flux, there's a society in flux. How fitting that at the center of this, is a girl who was born out of wedlock, whose own romantic and, by extension, sexual desires are to be utterly controlled by the older generation for a profit, for a kind of stability, one might argue, and for a satisfaction of their own demands and desires, closing their ears to the younger generation with tragic consequences. Sive is mythic. It's Greek in its tragic scale. It echoes the influences of Singh's great Aran Islands tragedy, Riders to the Sea, such as with the singing and the weeping over Sive's watery corpse at the end of the play, which so resembles Mora's laments at the conclusion of Riders to the Sea, which you might remember was, was if you tuned in to our Riders to the Sea, Sing talk, that uh, the wonderful actress Breege Nynjokten brought to life so uh, movingly when she keened, when she lamented um, on the webinar. So that's Ive. It's an incredible play. Sharon's Grave premiered in Cork the following year and it roots itself in similarly epic territory, but positions that epic quality in a far more central, explicit location and that mythic quality. Trassy Con Lee must defend her land against the threats of her evil cousin, Dinzi Con Lee, while also tiptoeing towards falling in love with that itinerant Thatcher, Pater Minogue. Meanwhile, Trassi's brother, Nilus, is obsessed by a mythic princess who was thrown to her death not far from this house. Frustrated sexual desire, supernatural possibilities, and insatiable greed and, and insatiable greed for land drive this rollicking love story towards its explosive conclusion. Now, one of Pitt's great actors, with whom I've had the pleasure of working twice, including on our production of Sharon's Grave at Pict. Jim Fitzgerald is going to join me now, and he's going to read a passage from Dinsey Conley, a character you can't but compare to Richard III. Now in this speech, Dinsey tries to cajole Trassie into giving up her land to him. I will not leave here. I will never leave here. My place is here. I want a little woman of my own to marry here. No one will have me if I haven't a house and land. What would you do if you had this millstone of mine on your back? What would you do if you had only dead branches for legs? What would you do if you were never to feel the grassy ground under your feet? or never to vault a gate or a ditch, and you passing through the land. What would you do when the fiddles are tuning up for the sets and everyone tapping toes on the stone floor? What would you do when the lads are kicking ball and you have a wild feeling to draw a kick for development? What would you do? Easy for you and Jack here, with your legs firm and strong and your straight backs. I have nothing to show for myself at all. I have twists and turns in my body like a thorn tree. I'm no fool. Dinsey Conley is no fool. I know my value. 
But if I have this place, I will have plenty single women thinking of settling with me. Would you condemn me for that, Trassy? For thinking the way I do? Well, everyone knows you yourself will have no trouble lodging a man to you. And I swear to God, I will give you what few pounds I have to add to your fortune if you let me have this house and a bit of land and the few cows and the pony. But won't we go visit Neelis in his fine tall home when we get the fine day and the roads dry? Beautiful, beautiful, Jim. You have this, there is this hunger and you know, I mean, again, we could spend the whole session, we could spend five sessions on the magnificent character of Dinsey Conley and you portrayed him so terrifyingly and magnificently back in 2015 um, when we put this on stage. And there's all these threads, aren't there, of, of we've got this sexual repression yeah. and we've got the hunger of that. And you've got, if you don't have land, if you don't have access to capital, you're not getting married. So you're not satisfying the urge that you feel. It's, it's, it's crushing the kinds of pressures and demands and hungers that have no, no food to feed them, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's crushingly painful. Yeah. And everyone is striving for a way out and they cannot, cannot let go to see beyond their patch of land and yeah. the rocks that guard it in, to yeah. my mind. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly, exactly, right? It's, 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 again, it's like epic. It's like that, it's, it's like that poem, you know? It's about this land, I can't see anything more. And uh, again, so much, and you're seeing the, the love pouring in for you, Jim, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> well deserved. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an epic play. It's a, it's a magnificent mountain of a play yeah. with so the ravines and the crevices are so intricate and it, it's just fascinating, it's simply fascinating. And you know, there's been all this interesting writing done by scholars and certainly by playwrights like Keane and, and, and Murphy and so many playwrights of the 20th century where we see the primacy of land and the need for land and, 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 and the way in which land is inherited that shifts over um, as Ireland moves into the modern era, right? Where one child inherits the whole land, we get, we get families bound in together in all these different um, overlaps of mistrust or scheming or um, manipulation or fear. Um, older generations fearing about letting go of the land to the younger generation so that the younger generations can get married because of the fear that they will have giving up the land that they'll be old and, and unwell and have no shelter. I mean, it's King Lear. You yeah. know, I and give the absolute grinding poverty, the yeah. fear of that grinding poverty yeah. that once you're under it, you'll never get out. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it's something I've got a couple of striking quotes and striking thoughts about how the land connects in with a sense of how I can avoid, how can I can escape that poverty, that abyss of not having enough to feed myself or my family if I have one. And we see this nowhere more powerfully or disturbingly than in the play that will probably be John B. Keane's most famous outside of Ireland, which is The Field, um, which was first produced, and thank you so much, Jim, which was thank first you. produced um, in 1965 by Gemini Productions at the Olympia Theatre in Dublin. 
and a note. The reason I mention uh, Gemini Productions is that um, Gemini Productions was run by actor, producer, and all around theater powerhouse, Phyllis Ryan, who played a central role in giving Keene's work the platform in national professional theater that it richly deserved. And if you know the life of any artist, you know that there are people like Phyllis Ryan, who was an artist herself, of course, but people who make choices about where to shine the light. And that it's the hard work and the inspiration and the genius of the artist, but it's the encounter with someone who says, this has to happen. This person needs to be known, needs to be seen. And Alan knew, our, 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 our dear Alan, um, knew Phyllis quite well and worked with her extensively. Um, so, so that might be something we might return to later on. Um, oh, oh, you're muted. Uh, oh, I'm back. Am I back? I'm not muted. Yeah, at another time. I knew Phyllis very well. In fact, I, I owe an awful lot to her for the early part of my career. And I knew John B as well. So, um, uh, yes, that uh, that the field really did... I think uh, entrenched John B. Keane as a major playwright, where, it, where he hadn't been, as you say, in those indolent periods of the Abbey Theatre. He was not recognised for what he was, but the field really did um, root him firmly in the landscape of great Irish theatre writing. And and again, because I think, and as you just mentioned, because of all the plays, the field is specific about the land and the importance of the land and as you were saying with regard to Sharon's grave and also with regard to Saif, that that your position in society be that society parish society was dependent on the land on your having the land and of course in the field the Bulma cave does not own the land which is where the problem arises yes Sorry, I just, as you said that, I just thought I'm going to open up the field script because there's a line here that I don't have written down, but it's exactly this. Yeah. And it's, again, we could spend a year talking about the field, but this line is so revealing. And we'll actually tell you what the field is about if you don't know in a moment. But bull, the bull is talking to his son, Tyg, about a woman who Tyg might marry. And Tyg says um, that she has nine acres of land. And he says, nine acres of land. Think of it. Keep your napper screwed on and we'll be important people yet. Important people, boy. And that's it, isn't it? That's it. Your land gives you importance. And you know, this point about this, you know, the parochial sense of it, the parish, you are, your position in the parish is dependent on your position in the land, is just as true of urban living. It is just as true whether you live in 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 uh, in the inner city, whether you even if you're homeless, mm. your patch is your patch, and it gives you that sense of importance and dignity. But anyway, back to the field. Yeah. So, and and as a lot of people will know, the field is also often known outside of Ireland because of the film adaptation made in 1990, directed by Jim Sheridan um, and starring Richard Harris. As we've talked about, this is the story of a piece of land and the terrible lengths to which one man will go to keep a hold of it. The Bull McCabe has rented a piece of land from widow Maggie Butler for years, doing, during which time he has grazed his cattle there and he feels he's made the land. The, the, the grass, the clover that grows there is rich and, um, and luscious. And this is not about her possession of the land, technically. It's about what he's given to the land. And that forges the relationship, which he sees as more, as, 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 um, as taking precedence over this technicality of, of the widow owning the land. He loves the land, he feels ownership of it, and is shocked when he hears that Mrs. Butler is planning to sell it to the highest bidder. Now, Alan, would you mind reading that first selection from the first act? Yep. I watched this field for 40 years, and my father before me watched it for 40 more. 
I know every rib of grass and every thistle and every white thorn bush that bounds it. There's Shamrock in the southwest corner. Shamrock! Imagine! The north part is bound by forty slow bushes. Some fool planted them once, but they're a good hedge. This is a sweet little field. This is an independent little field that once eaten. When old Maggie's husband died five years ago, I knew he was dying. One look at the writing under his eyes, I knew. I knew the wife was feeling the pitch lately. I knew that by the writing. It was wrote as plain as a process across her forehead and in the wrinkles of her cheeks. She was feeling the pinch of hunger. Erd, I swear to you that I could tell what a man be thinking by the writing on his face. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. It's really a, a wonderful, I think it's wonderful in the, within that one speech, it encapsulates such love yes. of what he is and where he is. It is an encapsulation of his, it, it, it is his bonding to the land. It is his bonding to the, and it is just a field and that we would just say, oh, look, there's a field. Uh, it, but for him, it is his universe. And he knows every every scrap of it. And that he also knows, because he can read the land, he can read the person. He can see the writing on the land. He can see the writing in the face. Yes. And the writing in the face spells one overwhelming word, poverty. Yeah. Um, um. She was she uh, she was feeling the pinch of hunger, mm. and so his understanding, uh, what Keen puts into the bull, this phenomenal understanding of who he is, where he is, and what he is, and that he is of that place, of that time, and he has the dignity that the land gives him. And, and I see it, I mean, just in that speech we just heard, because what we learn about the bull throughout the course of the play is incredibly dark. Go this ahead. is a man who, it's not just about the deed that's done over this land. This is a bad man. This mm. is a man who hurts animals. This is a man who delights in inflicting his will and power over people and animals, over living things. But he is also a man who loves so specifically. This mm. isn't just about ego. This isn't just about power and, and the big ideas of why I want this land. It's about a blade of grass. Yeah. And it, it, actually, the, the great Phyllis Ryan in her memoir says something beautiful about this. And it goes back to the Shakespearean characterization that no villain is simply uh, you know, twisting his mustache and going, ha, ha, ha. you know, these are people driven by things any of us could feel. She says, the bull was not a one dimensional villain. He could not be portrayed as merely an ignorant monster motivated by greed. He was all these things, but he was also a man who understood that the earth and grass of the fields were necessary for his survival and for that of his descendants. It's exactly what you're talking about, Alan. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, you can put it into any context of somebody who feels so passionate about what they believe has such a love for their belief, such a love for their property, their land, their whatever, that it, they are filled with such love that they will kill anything else that gets in the way of it. And then you get that great dichotomy of passionate love for something that results in a passionate hatred for mm -hmm. everything else. Yeah. Um, and that's that's so perfectly, I mean, that happens in so much drama, so much poetry, so much literature, right back to the Greeks. And Keen encapsulates it so beautifully in the Bull McCabe. Absolutely. And he also, oh, go ahead. 
but but I mean the term the bull McCabe is perfect because the bull is the ultimate bully. Yeah. On that sense. Yeah. Um, now we'll we'll press pretty quickly on to to your next reading, Alan. And this is when the stranger William B arrived to town, ready to outbid the bull McCabe. Yeah. The bull's thoughts go to extreme measures, and remember, the whole town. They know, including the the publican, who's also the auctioneer, who's selling, you know, who's doing, who's organizing the bidding on this land. The bull has informed him, "You know, I have cousins around this area. If you don't let me have my way, I will burn down this place, or we will boycott this place." So the whole town, the whole community goes, right, we're going to play along with this. But this outsider goes, what are these rules? I'm buying this land. And the bull's mind goes to the dark. Go yes. ahead. I'm a fair man, and I want nothing but what's mine. I won't be wronged by my own village, in my own country, by an imported land grabber. The sweat I've lost won't be given for nothing. A total stranger has come and he wants to buy my sweat and blood. He wants to bury my sweat and blood in concrete. It's again God and man, and I was never the person to bow the head when trouble came and no man's going to do me out of my natural born rights. Now, this robber comes from nowhere and he's nothing less than a robber. And you all know the cure for a robber. He must be given a fright, and a fright he's going to get. But people forget, old friends, when there's danger. And if this man gets a fright and a bit of a beating, we'll have the civic guards going around asking questions. Now, you know the kind, the kind of civic guards is. What is friends for, I ask, unless it is to pull one another out of hoots? What is neighbours and relations for, unless... "'Tis to love ye one another,' says the gospel. "'So when the civic guards come with their long noses, "'all of you will remember that Tig and myself were in this pub "'at the time that Robin Gazebo got his dues. "'We'll give him just enough to teach him a lesson. "'Now, I'll want to promise, won't I, "'to show we can trust one another. "'Dandy, You'll take an oath on the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's evil. He is he is a personification of evil. Um, for it's a strange thing, but we gain sympathy for him because of his passion, yeah. and realize that because of his passion, he has become evil. And he understands perfectly how oh. this place works. Yes. Yeah. You know? And he talks about those police officers coming in and it's the final scene of the play. Now the film is different in a couple of ways. The final scene of the play is the priest and the police officer trying to get anything out of the bull. Yeah. And nothing yeah. comes. Neither of those forces of, of, of the power structure. Yeah. Any sway in this place. I am minded of, uh, in, certainly in America, what happened over the last few years in terms of uh, rights of land, uh, rights of, of open spaces, rights of grazing, uh, stands off, standoffs with local police, with, with local, uh, even the National Guard in some cases. It's exactly that same thing happening. Uh, and it happens over and over again everywhere. When because it is to come, and I think your choice of the Kavanaugh poem at the beginning is absolutely perfect, because all major conflict, what was the famous uh, Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill's comment, all politics is local politics, mm -hmm. and everything is local, everything is specific. Can I, can I just, um, because we've got limited time left, very limited time left, but can I just raise a couple of points, um, and you've used that phrase yourself, uh, in terms of describing him, and I'm trying to find me notes underneath all the bits of scripts. Yes. Um, with these plays, I call them the plays of poverty, because I think that is the grinding force. But you could also call them the plays of land, uh, because even inside, land is an issue. Yeah. Um, these are 
these these are tragedies not just in the sense that they are um they have unhappy endings but they are tragedies on that greek scale aren't they 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 have the enormity of that this is uh this is troy uh this is um this is you know oedipus this is these these are plays that are universal and eternal because they are particular um, and that the the debate within these plays can be recognized anywhere. I, I mean, I remember saying to you, we could we could reset Sharon's grave, we could reset Sive, even the field, mm. almost in any country with an agrarian society. I've said it. You know, we could we could set we could set Sive in Appalachia. We could set Sive in in the the in the, the, the in, 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 the Louisiana Delta. We could set it anywhere in Arizona or Wyoming. We could set it in central China. We could set it in India. It's exactly that same um, society, that, that parochial, as as, uh, as as opposed to provincial, the parochial society that in which all of these plays constantly take place. They're constantly reoccurring. What do you feel about the? Um, I, I, I wrote down the note: the gods and devils, the mystic characters. Um, each of the well, not so much the field, but certainly Sharon's grave and and Sive have these somewhat strange, almost like Greek chorus characters, or um, uh, you have the evil, you have the suffering. But there seems to be a mystic aspect to it. Um, what do you read into that? Well, yeah, it's it's a very it's a very interesting question, um, and it makes me think back to the headline of the obituary when Keane died in two thousand two, um, and um, Fintan O'Toole's obituary. The headline read something like "The Magic of Pagan Ireland." dies with Keen. And what's remarkable about it is these plays, now not all of Sing, uh, now not all of Keen's plays, but these plays that we're talking about, they don't really have priests in them. Mm. They have we have the priest in the field, but that's basically as a representative of an impotent power. Yeah. Because the big speech that all of the thing, all of the ways in which the priest tries to get the community to inform, to say what happened, are fruitless. So we have this world, which when you know when Keen talks about these people being closer to the land, when he talks about his enemy, his enemy being the person who would reduce people who work the land. Um, to laughable or naive or simple or whatever else. He says, no, these are the people. Yeah. They're connected in with what can, especially in somewhere like Kerry, on the wild coast, this can only be understood in supernatural terms. Mm. You know, And if we think about some of what's going on in Singh as well, um, there is these elements the weather the the earth nature in general take on a almost a personified quality and it is in this supernatural realm yeah it's 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 i i find that fascinating because in each of the places there, there is the unbelief in sharon's grave sorry in Sive, nana the the, the yeah. grandmother is not merely the grandmother uh, and an example of a woman who has nothing left now except that she's confined to the one room and she is living in poverty by the grace of, of her son. But she's also a well of folk wisdom. And by folk wisdom, I mean it is the tradition of how people have lived for generations and generations and generations. Mm -hmm. And she even knows that the end is coming for her and for her time. But, uh, as you say, there is no effectual religion in these plays. And the priest in the field is 
you know, he's sold out. Uh, the church, in that sense, has sold out. It has gone against the parochial, uh, maybe to the good, but he's gone against the parochial, the law of the parish, as it were, the way the parish works. Yeah. And in in uh, and and each of the uh, these plays, particularly in Sharon's Grave, you have a much closer affinity to folk wisdom, folk law, folk knowledge, and folk superstition, because. Yeah. If, if you know, it's the old thing. If the God didn't exist, we'd invent him or her, mm. and and that is what sort of happens in this kind of, of of rural drama anywhere in the world. We create magic. We create we create witches. We I mean, you know, the American classic uh, Dark of the Moon. Uh, the, it, we, we we these societies tend to build their own law, and 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 the plays especially Sharon's Grave and Scythe, have explicit characters yeah. who enter. We have Pats Bocock and, and Carhalon in Scythe, yeah. and we have Pats Bobui in Sharon's Grave, yeah. who are explicit navigators of the two worlds. Yeah. And and we might view some characters might view them as snake oil salesmen and others view them as, as very true healers um but they're speaking in a very explicit way about an, an, an a natural order that is very much connected in with the supernatural order you think yeah. about what's said over and over and over again by Pat Bocock in Scythe is it is not right to marry a young girl to an old man yeah. and that's a principle of nature yes that's, that's the point. point that is and it, it is about how nature works a yeah. society that is governed by the natural order rather than an imposed set of rules. Yeah. We could keep on talking for hours on topic, but we've actually hit our two-hour point or our one-hour point. So um, I, I, I'm going to wrap it up. I just want to say, you know, one of the, to me, one of the harrowing things about these three plays in particular is that there is no redemption, that they end in like King Lear, and and I liked your your reference to Lear earlier. Like King Lear, they are, as Yang Cott put it, the ultimate tragedy of despair. That at the end of these plays, nothing is resolved. The world does not move forward. It is, it is, it is. Uh, and and Jim, when we were talking yesterday about this, says these plays are terrible in the pure sense of that word. They 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 incite terror into you as to how humanity can behave to one another within the parish and parish to parish or <laughs> Athens to Troy, uh, with whatever level you put it on. But listen, Aoife, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Your authority on Irish folk drama defeats mine completely. You are amazing. And thank you so much for that. Um, and I want to say a quick word about what's coming up. So I'm going to say goodbye to Aoife. On, on screen so I can have a quick chat um, bless you and you'll be back uh, with regard to next the next two weeks uh, we're also going to deal with an Irish writer but a very different Irish writer I've talked about him before and I will talk about him endlessly again but we're going to look at one of his plays the writer is Oscar Wilde the play is possibly the greatest comedy ever written which will be the importance of being earnest. And I'm gonna spend two webinars talking about um, the essence, the structure, um, the, the logics behind it. So the next two weeks will be on the importance of being earnest. Um, in the meantime, please spread the word. Please invite your friends to join us. It's so easy now. It's much easier than it used to be. You don't have to register. You just have to tune into the site and there you are. Well, you know that because you've done it. Um, one or two other tiny points. Um, we are always looking to get the webinar sponsored. It does cost money to put them out. We have to pay for the airtime and all of that. So if anybody's interested in sponsoring a webinar, send us an email and we'll get back to you with the details. If you can't go for a sponsorship, always remember, as I said at the beginning, every dollar does count. And in these terrible times, we know how precious dollars are, but they matter to us as well. So if you can send, no matter how small it is, if you can send a small donation, we will be very, very grateful indeed. In the meantime, I hope I'll see you all next week. Oscar Wilde, the importance of being earnest. Look after yourselves. 
Wash your hands, wear your masks, and don't breathe on one another. Bye now.